Hello, everyone. We've got a bit of a different show for you this week. We're going to take a one-week break from Climate Tech News and focus on the state of EVs with an interview with a star automotive journalist. His name is Yuri Tereshin. He's one of the biggest automotive reviewers on YouTube right now with his channel, The Straight Pipes. We had a great talk with him, and I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Hello, and welcome to Episode 109 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian. I'm James. I'm Yuri, and we're going for a podcast. This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Well, welcome to the podcast, Yuri. This is the first guest we've ever had on the show. So thank you so much for getting in touch. I'm a huge fan of the Straight Pipes channel on YouTube. I've been watching it for years. I subscribed very early. And uh, yeah, it's just a huge uh, pleasure to talk to you as a huge resource for uh, electric vehicles. Yeah, it's uh, nice being on the show with you guys. You guys have a lot of really like interesting information that's clean energy, but not just EV stuff too. So it's uh, really interesting to hear. And then I love the uh, the TikTok, just being able to go through the little things quick. That's been that's been really nice. So yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, we're technically we're too old for TikTok, but. Uh... We try. We haven't danced yet. When we dance, our numbers will go up. It's just I'm working on my moves, and I got to get a hip replacement. Different TikToks for different age groups, and it's uh, I'm I think I'm on older people TikTok too. I've never seen a <laughs> single Charlie D'Amelio dance at all. Never in my free page. <laughs> YouTube does nothing for us. Uh, I don't even know why I post stuff there. But you were saying that. Uh, it's kind of hard to grow your channel, but you, you're pretty well established now, right? Yeah, we started in uh, 2015 doing reviews. To, we filmed our first review in 2015 in November and started posting in 2016 and then got pretty regular by 2017 with two reviews a week. Uh, we just yeah. do new car reviews, gas, electric, even though it's called the straight pipes, that's because Jacob started the channel uh, filming exhaust and he loves loud exhaust. I personally don't like exhausts too loud myself, so any of my fast cars all have like the trick exhaust that i can close it when i want it to be nice and quiet and leave the house okay uh, i in the 90s i used to have a comedy show on local television and it was a, with a partner his name is kevin and to this day people will come up on the street decades later and say where's kevin as if he should be right beside me do you ever get that from people who watch your channel where's jacob uh yeah a lot of the time like today jacob was posted a video from when he was in alberta and he just did a solo video because i didn't go out there for the rolls royce event a lot of the comments were like, where's Yuri? Where's Yuri? But then I got my own solo video of the Volvo C40 ah. electric the next week. But we've just been doing that a little bit here and there, just when like we want to do different things. I subscribed to the Straight Pipes when you guys had around 1,000 subscribers. And then at a certain point, it just took off. I think you're up to about 1.5 million now. So you guys are in Ontario. I noticed, you know, the the the, the book says to appeal to Americans, because that's where nine times the audience is. But you guys seem like you're even, like, you know, you put things in kilometers and you you kind of balance it evenly between the two countries. Is that correct? Uh, we're Canadian, so we'll give the Canadian pricing. And then uh, yeah. we'll do kilometers, because I don't understand miles. And I'll do liters yeah. per 100 kilometers, because I also don't understand miles yeah. per gallon. But then we'll convert as much as we can, just because, like, 50% of our audience is from the USA. And then, like, only 10 to 15 is from Canada. But... Like, it's the size difference. Like, what can you do? You just have to, you know, accept that. But we don't do, like, the exact pricing of cars for USA just because, like, everything in Canada gets heated seats and a heated steering wheel. But the USA, like, does not right. add that on any specs, usually. So yeah. there is no, like, direct price, usually. So we just do the direct conversion. Have you ever been to Western Canada, Yuri? Yeah, a couple times. I used to live in Nelson for six months. Oh, well, that Nelson's a tropical paradise compared to Saskatchewan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It gets cold here, so we have a, a very weird dynamic about uh, electric cars in winter. And um, I've had one for a few years. I've got a 13 Nissan Leaf. Brian has a Tesla Model 3, and I d haven't had any problems with mine. Uh, it works really great. I, I It gets down to minus 40. I pass by people who are getting boosts in their combustion cars and trucks and my neighbors and are waiting for cabs. But now that there's a lot more electric vehicles here, uh, than there used to be. We're starting to see more winter problems. Um, what do you guys think about electric vehicles in the winter time? I mean, in Ontario winter. I'm, I'm making quotes. I'm all right with it. Like even in Quebec winter, you just need to accept that your range is lower and and just take that into account. And like I'd be fine with it if I had one all winter. Like, like I I don't know. I don't think there is much of an issue as long as you're reasonable about 
what the battery is capable of. Do you have an idea of what the range is uh, percentage-wise in uh, winter testing that you've done? Have you seen a noticeable drop like 40% or less than that? I don't think we've really done like full winter testing because you only get the cars for a week in, in for press cars here. And then if you get the press car, are you going to do like a full road trip and a full tank or are you going to drive it around enough, get it charged up, get the review done on yeah. the day with nice weather? Because like right. say we get a car on Monday, right? Now some of the cars we get on like a Tuesday and then we need to film either Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever day has the nicest weather. So if it's a Thursday, what we'll try to do is put in as many hours on the Wednesday, but we aren't going to necessarily going to be able to range test it. And then if we're going to performance test it, then all our range figures go out the window because we've just been flooring it through Cliche Corner for like 10 minutes. And when did car companies start coming to you? When did your phone start to ring with, uh, you know, will you review our uh, BMW? Oh, man. Well, we had to approach everyone after doing a bunch of like friend cars. And then right. we started getting press cars, like the crappier ones. And then we got the nicer ones. And even, and then after that, you know, we get invited to some trips. But even like now, being in Canada, it's like a way different world than in the States, even though we're like one of the top car review channels in North America and worldwide, it's still like a fight to get cars up here for us sometimes. Really? And like, we don't get invited to certain events and stuff like that. It's, Have you been flown to San Diego or anything like that? We've been flown around a lot uh, when we were traveling before all the COVID stuff. But yeah, I know getting cars up in Canada is tricky. And even for them to get the cars compared to how fast USA gets them. So we'll, Canada usually gets cars like a month or two later, which makes it even right. trickier. So they've yeah, been... You want them right away because yeah. everybody else has their videos out and yeah, you have to add something different. But they um, but they, they get us cars like pretty quickly for the most part, like the BMW iX and the i4, like BMW called us up. They're like, we got the iX, cool, right away. And then we got the i4 after. So that was nice. Like a lot of companies are pretty good about getting us the cars very quickly. But uh, yeah, it yeah. Takes, takes a while, but Canada's still a little weird about that stuff. So what's the vibe when you get flown to, I don't know, Tennessee or somewhere, and there's a bunch of car reviewers from YouTube? Uh, is that a community, or are you competitive with each other? I mean, uh, or does people just keep to themselves? Uh, well, the YouTubers are cool with each other. We're, we're all having fun, but the thing is, we go on the Canadian waves, not the U.S. waves. So, okay. in, so we're just hanging out with the other Canadians, but most of them are article writers. So they're not yeah. like on the same page as us. Like they like to do the scavenger hunts and like all the fun stuff and stop at the dinner stops and lunch stops. Really? Well, because like, it's like a drive route and we're just like, leave yeah. us alone, give us the car. We're going to go do our thing just because filming takes a lot longer. And Yeah, so, writing's nothing. You know, well, putting I, up 16 different cameras. I, I'm not going to say writing's nothing because I'm not good at writing. But uh, huh? the writers, if there's no embargo, will have articles out by the first lunch stop where really? we can't do okay. that. But I don't know anything about writing. So for video, I just know it takes longer. <laughs> but uh, it, it's fun. It's just like, it's more hectic on trips for the YouTube guys. And now they're having to do like video only waves where it'll be like, this group is just doing video. We have a different program for them than the writers so that they can get everything they need because they know that it's taking longer. Yeah, and I want to compliment you on the filming technique, like the visually... The editing, like the Straight Pipes channel, it's it's one of the reasons I love it so much. It's just one of the most well-produced shows uh, on YouTube. So nice job. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was kind of like our, uh, I think our gimmick to start us off before we had much car knowledge was that our car footage looked better than everyone else's. And it was <laughs> like, I guess, up there with like motor trend quality at the time, which you couldn't get from anyone else. It was just like GoPro stuff. So I think that helped us at the start. But now everyone coming in has really good film quality. Like there's another channel... Uh, Accelerate that I think just hit 125k subs from London, Ontario, and their film stuff blows us out of the water. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess that's the evolution of people on YouTube. Okay, well, we'll wow. hang up on you and go talk to them then. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Next, next guest. <laughs> How many cameras do you own? Like right now, I guess probably like don't be shy. Fifteen, but a lot of them I don't use. <laughs> it might be like old Insta 360s or. DSLRs that just sit in a box and collect dust. Okay, how many uh, are active and could be used on the show? On like one shoot day, it'll be 2800, 6500, uh, maybe Insta 360. Uh, if we bring a drone, uh, and then there's two cell phones. So we're, we're running at least like nine devices. They should use cell phones too. Well, the dynamic range on the new iPhone is insane. And for filming interiors, yeah. like you, you'll know, Brian, it, if you try to film the interior of a car, it's super, you, you brighten it up. 
and then yeah. outside is blown out and that doesn't look cool. So with the iPhone, it'll do, it's got like the computer built in. So you get a really nice dynamic range. Like you don't get good depth of field or anything. It doesn't look cinematic, but at least everything is exposed. This could be the most interesting fact that we come up with today. I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> it's better than a GoPro. At, for for at exposure, dynamic range. Dyna it's for the best because it's a computer, right? You're, you've got like a two thousand yeah. uh, dollar computer phone camera in your pocket, and it's like okay. But is that what you're using for the interior two shot? Then no, we use the DSLR with a hybrid log gamma because we want depth of field because we don't want it to look like a GoPro because GoPros are easy and if everything don't give away too easy, many secrets, man. I'm just giving <laughs> I'm out giving away secrets. There's certain secrets that I'm allowed to give out. Certain secrets. There's one, our, our, our car to car rolling camera. We've never told anyone and no one will ever know. Okay. <laughs> well, Brian's going to Ontario in May. And yeah, he's I'll show him. If he's, if he's there, I'll show him. Yeah. I'll, I'll just hang out at Cliche Corner and, uh, and, and wait for you. There's a YouTuber here uh, in Regina called The Detail Geek, and he cleaned my Tesla Model 3, and that's got like, uh, you know, over a, over a million views. Yeah, a million people saw what a pig Brian is. <laughs> those, detail, those detail videos do really well, but I'm unfortunately not a detailer, and I don't like to detail cars, so I, wouldn't, I wasn't, wasn't able to put any of those out on our channel. There was one video you did a couple of years ago with the ice drifting that had a lot of drone work. Uh, that one was amazing. That must have been, uh, that must have been tough to shoot. Uh, not really, because uh, I'm good at flying drones, or at least I was back then because that was my old job, and then... I'm flying drones, chasing cars where there's no trees for once on a racetrack. <laughs> so, and, but I'm like fully zoomed in cause it was the Mavic zoom. So it, it was nice not having obstacles and being able to track anything the way I wanted to. So it was only difficult cause it was cold, but it was like really fun and probably like the most satisfying video we filmed. Yeah, no, it looked, uh, looked um, amazing. Um, should we get into talking about some cars? So, Yuri, you've driven more EVs than most humans, I think. So, uh, yeah, we want to talk to you about some of the EVs you've driven. All right, so I got the numbers. So I think of our 500 car reviews we've done so far, uh, we've done 28 electric vehicles and 57 hybrid vehicles. But some of those hybrid vehicles are like the AMG E53 with EQ Boost, so it doesn't count. There's some We've done some Volvos that are plug-in, but, uh, yeah, some of them are more electric -y. Yeah, so let's start with some of the expensive ones. And I know you did the recent uh, Mercedes Electric. Was that the EQS? So yeah. let, let's start by talking about the ones that nobody can afford. I got them on my okay. list. Well, pretty much no electric cars you can afford, it seems like, these days. Or you can't even, if you can't afford <laughs> yeah. it, you can't get one for two years. Well, like EV6 just closed their stuff or whatever, and you can't get it. Yeah, you can't order an EV6 anymore, yeah. So um, the EQS, very cool, very luxurious, lots of gimmicks. The, it's, it's more like of a show than an actual car I want to drive. And uh, it's fast. It's cool. The lights were insane. Did you see how the lights changed while you drive? But yeah, it's just like, I think that's more of just like a, a PR car than like a realistic car you'd want to own. Because even the back seat room wasn't that much, but it was, it was very interesting and it was cool. But uh, not something I really cared about. <laughs> But I mean, it must always be fun driving like super crazy expensive cars like that. It's fun, a little stressful because like at the end of the day, you're responsible for it kind of. But uh, it, <laughs> right. it, it is cool being able to explore all the stuff, but it, it does suck. Like you get in and you realize that all this, everything's touch and it's like, it's frustrating. And you're like, no, I'm going to have to like be negative because I don't know how to use anything. And I don't like this. And I just want my hard buttons, but maybe I'm a little bit old school when it comes to that. But um it is fun getting in and like discovering how crazy the ambient lighting and stuff like that. I really had fun with that. Have you ever had an, an accident with a car like that? Like something bad? Uh, no, we've been good. We, uh, always, we're always careful about everything. Cause like the number one thing, it's like, if you break cars, like you might not be able to work much longer and we want to keep working cause you know, we got kids and stuff. So, uh, yeah, we're careful, but you never know, right? Uh, where we film a cliche corner, it's a kind of skinny, sketchy road, and sometimes big tractors come through there. And if someone's too wide or, or cutting a corner, like, there's nothing you can do and you get hit. And that's why, like, I don't even want to take, like, if I ever drove a, a really expensive car, like a million-dollar car, like, I wouldn't even want to take it through there just in case someone coming the other way does something weird. Wow. Yeah, and for those, sorry, for those who don't know, Cliche Corner is a road in Ontario where you, you drive all the cars. Yeah, and we, we call it Cliche Corner because it's the most cliche filming road for a car review. And it turns out it's the only road for a car review that looks cool in Southern Ontario. So that kind of sucks too about it. 
Yeah, they're all straight here in Saskatchewan. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, if you give a car back that you've hated and you have to deal with a rep, do you lie? Do you say, yeah, it was good. Yeah, no, I liked it. Like, <laughs> How does that go? Uh, no, well, the thing is, everything we say negative, we show on video. Right. So if I, say, it if I say this screen is laggy and I show the screen being laggy, I'm in the clear. It's their fault, not mine. So as opposed right. to articles, they may write this screen is laggy, this seat's not this, and this, this isn't whatever. They're not showing it, so maybe they'll get in more trouble, but like we have evidence of everything we say, and they can fix that by making it faster. But you know, we don't say anything that we can't back up with video, which is one of the nice things about our uh, channel. But I mean, if someone doesn't like, we don't really get in trouble. You just yeah. got to be fair. You can't just like go out and hate it for no reason. And before we move on, what is your favorite car review channel? Uh, I, th I think Savage Geese. He's out of Chicago. He's just very, yeah. uh, very realistic about everything. And if I needed to take someone's advice over anyone else's advice, it'd probably be his. Yeah, he goes quite in depth on the on each car. Yeah, every every car's got to go on the hoist. He goes underneath. He, he talks about all kinds of stuff that goes like way over my head and like a lot of engineering stuff that because uh, I'm more like user interface and user experience kind of thing, and he's right. very uh, engineer about it. So it, it's cool to see the different well, take on it. That's kind of your appeal, though. You're the regular person, the person just like the people buying the car. You're giving a, a very consumer perspective on what things are like, and uh, I think that's. That's part of why you're successful. Well, I wanted to ask, so you were just talking about hard buttons. So you have a preference for hard buttons in cars. So we should maybe get to another expensive car and maybe talk about Tesla because, of course, they're known for having almost everything on the touchscreen. And I know you drove a, a Model X. So that's uh, another expensive car. Okay, so the Model X, that was actually from Tesla PR, which was crazy really? because they don't have that. So No, they don't normally do that. Yeah, and uh, we actually kind of got banned from that because we were driving with the doors up and like at the beginning oh. so they're like you guys can't be doing this stuff so we, we look bad but i mean tesla's kind of a meme company and like everything they do stuff like that so we thought it was okay but i guess it comes down to like that's not safe on the road but you know we're in like a private lot doing it back and forth slowly so like at like zero kilometers an hour two kilometers an hour but um yeah so that car i think my theory behind tesla and their user interface with the no hard buttons is they have a better design team than everyone else. And therefore, it's easy. It, it makes more sense. It's more natural. So like in the Mach-E, it was hard to use that vertical tablet style thing. It just wasn't as intuitive as a Tesla was. It was just like, it felt like that was more Android. And then Tesla's more Apple, where it's like, okay, you're not going to get all the features right away. But the features we're going to give you are going to be really good. And they're all going to work perfectly. And that's how I felt when I drove that Tesla. But I haven't driven a Tesla since. And I think they... Did a former update where the infotainment is now different, but I'm not sure. They've changed it, so it is, I find it slightly harder to use now. But, of course, they're moving towards an autonomous future, so I, I think they're thinking, well, it, you know, if you can't access a button, don't worry, because the car will just drive itself in a, a couple of years. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that stuff. Like, my, my old <laughs> devices, I don't update anything that I don't need to update. My iPhone will, I'll update it, but I don't update apps automatically. I just... As I need to update it, if I'm forced to, I'll update it. If not, I'll keep it old just because I hate everything about that. And even like Kias, you take them to the dealer and there's like a key infotainment that I really like, like the 2018, 19 stuff. I think the dealers will update your system and it'll update the infotainment. So now you have, a, in my opinion, worse infotainment that you weren't expecting. And I don't think you can go back. So like, I don't like the updates. I like to be able to like stay on a certain firmware or whatever. And leave it there. Yeah, I kind of gave up fighting that, and I, I now do automatic updates. I don't know. It's, it, you can't fight City Hall. Do you find that the EVs are a bit weird, and that's they're trying to be, to stand yeah. out? Yeah, for sure. They're doing that because it's like marketing. Like They're just adding more weird things to them, and it's like, just stop adding weird stuff. Like the EV6, that button that you use to toggle between your climate controls and your radio controls, and it's like... I get that you're putting this in and I'm on the EV6 Facebook group and like everyone there is defending that to the death because they probably really? purchased it and they don't want to like, be like, they don't want to admit that their purchase is flawed. Yeah, no, I am not about the weirdness. Like the old Ionic, the first Ionic EV we drove, which was our first electric car, 
I think they nailed it at that point, and everything's just been like downhill since then. Everyone kind of does this where they feel like they have to make an upgrade, they have to make an update. Yeah. Whether and they don't take into account if it's worth, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And especially with um, the shortage of cars right now, and every car is like a, for sale or sold out ahead of time, they can literally get everything wrong and justify everything they did because they sold all their cars. They can be like, look, people love our weird capacitive touch buttons. They're all sold out. And it's like, <laughs> they're all sold out because we can't get cars. I noticed that a lot of your um, EV reviews have higher numbers than your regular reviews. Have you noticed that? Is that me uh, implying something that's not true? Uh, probably. So I think what it is, is for us, when a, when a car comes out, and if we can review it right when it comes out, it'll get more views. Uh, and if we wait too long on it, it won't get many views. That's why we turned down the Bolt EUV because Canada got it so late after the USA and we're like, it's going to flop if we post it now. So we just didn't bother booking it at all. Um, but I think the, the recent EV cars, they just came out at the same time or close enough to the US when they all came out. So the hype was still pretty high. As long as it comes out, like as, as long as we review it when it comes out, people are excited even for anything. And if we review a car that's been out for a while, people aren't as excited. Like we uh, reviewed a Chevy Traverse recently. Yeah. And uh, if you look at all the other car review channels, we're actually the most viewed car review channel in the world who has reviewed a Chevy Traverse <laughs> because that car doesn't do well. Like Doug doesn't have one, Throttle House <laughs> doesn't have one. So that's our that's our claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> the Traverse. Uh, so I want to get back to um, the Porsche Taycan, another expensive one. So uh, what do you remember about driving that? Uh, the Taycan... We actually got to drive that on the track with a, a Porsche for a Porsche event, and we only drove the turbo with all seasons. We didn't drive the turbo with performance tires. Um, for some reason, that's just how the event was set up. And with all seasons, man, that car was not fun on track at all. You're just like coming in and just like sloppy and then just powering out. But with the performance tires on the road, it felt like unreal. So, um, but yeah, that car, the performance is just insane. Uh, it's really, really fun to drive, but it's a it's like a different style of fun that I don't know if I'm like into as much as like a Miata with a manual transmission. Do you know what I mean? But it's, I like the interior. Do you like the interior? I like the styling of it. The styling's nice, but then you come back to you have to control your vents through your infotainment, which is uh. I don't like that. And then you know your climate's all touch buttons, which I'm sure is a lot less expensive to make because it's just like you're buying you're paying for two screens instead of a, a bunch of buttons that can fail and everything like that but it's just not my style but i do like the car a lot i had the rear wheel drive one in pink which was from the usa because we don't actually get the rear wheel drive in canada and mm -hmm. that one i really liked even though it was a slower model what is the challenge of evs with handling when you're comparing handling is it always a, an issue because they're heavier? Uh, well, they've got a lower center of balance, sort of center of gravity. So they even like an SUV EV will handle better than like a lot of cars. Uh, it's just that they all feel kind of the same because the transmissions and the motors, it's like that, that instant torque coming out. So it's more of a get through the corner and then blast your way. You're almost like bombing into corners and then hard on the brakes and then bombing out instead of like smoother with maybe like a gas car, slower car. It's just a different feeling that I'm not like, I don't really like. And I think they're all so fast that it's kind of like not that enjoyable anymore. Do you know, like everything's too fast. Yeah. Did, were you skeptical about EVs at first? And was there a, a point where you started to come around? No, I always liked EVs because our first EV was the Ionic EV. And uh, I thought that was like really cool. That was when we drove to Ottawa and back from Toronto that took 24 hours because of... Uh, charging and, and running level like the first couple of cars the evs we drove i ran out of battery and like all of them just figuring it really? all out so that was uh interesting experiences but no i always thought evs were cool i always thought they'd work out it's just i didn't realize in 2018 or 17 that the charging wasn't going to get better in five years yeah well as an aside i watched your toyota corolla crossover review at breakfast this morning with my toast and i got angry it's my trademark on the show to get angry well, it's the whole, uh, um, you, you, you've you got remote start on the fob for three years, and then they charge you for it. It's like charging you for a cigarette lighter. I mean, come on. I think we were corrected to 10 years. 
Okay. Um, but then, yes. So I guess that's just kind of the way companies are doing things. They realize they can get away with it. That if they, uh, even though the car has the hardware for it, it's going to send the signal and make sure your subscription is active for it. And I guess that's the way it ties into the app. That's one of those things that I don't like about uh, newer cars that I'm always trying to fight as well. So I feel like we're anti-subscription for car services and then we're anti um, apps for charging stations when I just want to pay with a credit card and get out of there kind Maybe of stuff. Sh- should we get into the charging issues now? Yeah, that's that's why Jacob didn't want to come on this because he's he's tired of talking about electric chargers. But I feel like <laughs> that's one of the things that I can maybe be, maybe help change in Canada with electric cars. So I'm very excited to to maybe do something positive with my YouTube channel. Yeah, well, w- with Brian's case with the Tesla, you plug it in, it knows your car, it builds your account, and uh, why can't they all be like that? Um, well, that's my I- question. I don't want to give every car my credit card number. So even that is kind of weird. It would be cool to me if you can just pay at a Tesla supercharger thing. But I guess the way Tesla is, you're forced to have it all connected, kind of like an iPhone with your Apple account, right? Yeah, and the Tesla chargers don't even have a screen because the screen is in the car. So, you know, once they open the network up to other cars, it will definitely have to be through the app because, yeah, there's no screen on the the charger itself. Yeah, and that's like proprietary for their cars, and I get it, and they're using that to make their car the more desirable electric car, but when it comes to everything else, I it's just like I, I keep picturing if you had to have an app to pay at like a Shell or a Petro Canada, like it would be insanity. Like I just want to go in, tap my card, put my card in, buy some snacks, get out. Like I don't want to have an app. And even right now, like how many electric car charging apps do you guys have on your phone? I don't have any, but I'm thinking of buying a new EV. And I'm thinking I'm going to have to have like five different apps and they're all going to have to have my credit card and they're all going to have to deal, you know, some of them are going to work, some of them are not going to work. Here in Saskatchewan, we never even had an, a fast charger until about, when, Brian, a couple of years ago? A couple of years ago, yeah. Then they all suddenly started to come. And now our two biggest cities are Regina and Saskatoon. Saskatoon's two and a half hours away. There's a Tesla charger at the halfway point at a town called Davidson. But there's no third-party chargers. So um, people going there have to charge on a level two uh, just to make that trip. It's, it's ridiculous. So... The chargers are new. EVs are new because we're, we do get down to minus 40. Uh, and because we're rednecks here, uh, or my fellow uh, citizens are, are not the first to uh, want to adapt to EVs. And it's oil country. Um, but then, you know, uh, in January, and in much of January, the Swift Current chargers uh, on the way to Calgary, between here and Calgary, uh, were down. And it's a small city. But they did have three charging stations, you know, three different branded charging stations plus a Tesla, right? Or two plus a Tesla. I'm not sure, but they there were was all a broken? Co-op. Yeah, no, there was three different charging stations, and they were all not, not working. Uh, the whole stations were not working. Uh, and it's not like they're overused. They're it's probably sporadically used by some EV nerd that goes through there every week, you know? Like, they're not used hardly at all. Uh, so, so what you were forgetting about those apps was every app, is going to hold a balance of at least $10 from your credit card Mm -hmm. on the app too. So if you forget or if a charging company disappears, you lose that 10 bucks or whatever. Cause I've had, I think I have 10 bucks on every single charging company app that I've just accepted as a loss. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Ridiculous. So that, so people, I read stories on Facebook people are staying in hotels because none of the three branded charging stations are working. Uh, that hardly ever get used. It's not like they're overused. They're not vandalized. They're just not working. I have I happen to think that there's a conspiracy. It, it's 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 so unbelievable that none of them are working. Yeah. Um. I don't know why they're not working, but from our one, I guess, month of reviewing like six electric cars, we found out that uh, Electrify Canada was down a bunch. We called a bunch to get them to fix it because I'm not going to just report on it and leave. And it took yeah. them a while to fix it uh, and then it went down again and then apparently they fixed it again but then they still couldn't even get the company the mall where they're located to remove the snowbank that was blocking the chargers really? to back in yeah and, and like they still couldn't and like <laughs> i literally filmed the video with like seven or eight different snow moving equipment within eyesight of this snowbank we asked for like a month they're and just- they, 
the bank is finally gone, thanks to the weather. But yeah, you know that happened, and then but that, they decided to put the snowbank by the EV chargers because what are those? Exactly, and then even a lot of other ones were blocked too. Like we were coming back from the racetrack, and there's an electric charger at the Wendy's near Cayuga. Oh, sure enough, the one like spot where all of the snow is is the electric tra- charging spot. And uh, some other Jesus journalists Christ. were at the new Ivy that they put in at like Canadian Tire in Mississauga. There's snow blocking that too. It's it's like it's kind of ridiculous. And that's not even the chargers working around it. That's just snow. You're literally getting iced. You're getting iced at the chargers <laughs> with ice. And and last summer, uh, when it was peak COVID and malls were closed in Ontario, they fenced off the way to get to the charger. And they're like, oh, go around this way, go around this way. And I'm like, I couldn't figure it out. And I guess they wanted me to go through the shipping route, which I was like, okay, I, I didn't get that. So I just moved barriers. And because I moved barriers, <laughs> Porsche got a little mad at me because I posted really? that in the video. Well, if you think about it, Porsche is a uh, Volkswagen group, which owns Electrify Canada yeah. and America. So oh. it all looked bad, I guess. And then also at the flow charger at Sherway, they coned off the underground parking at Sherway Mall. They coned off the underground parking where the flow charger was. And I moved cones to get in there too. And they're like, why are you doing moving cones? I'm like, well, I need to get to the electric charger. I'm like, well, it's closed off. I'm like, yeah, but the charger's on, it's working. And this is like where I want to charge. I would come back like later that week and I asked, I found the security guards and I asked them to move the cones for me and they were fine with that. And I'm like, why can't you just line the cones up so that people have access to this electric charger? And they said, we don't have enough cones. So like EV adoption <laughs> in Canada was being stopped because a mall didn't have enough cones. That's like part of it too. Jesus. <laughs> You know, so, something has to be done. Something has to be done. The journalist needs to investigate this. Well, we're, we're not even at why chargers don't work and how to get them fixed yet. That's just no, getting to the chargers. We so. haven't, you can't even get to them. And then if you're lucky enough to get to one, they yeah. don't work. You have a lot of viewers. Do you have any sense that you've made any impact that people are starting to pay attention to this problem? Uh, I mean, the comments are showing it a lot, but I think a lot of people just give up and they, they don't know how to do anything because even with our YouTube channel, we complained for I think three weeks that the Petro Canada chargers were down. And then we have a 1.5 million subscribers, right? And they were still down for three weeks until the last video. And then I, I messaged my contact at Ivy Chargers to contact the person at Petro. I messaged the AJAC, the Automotive Journal Association of Canada, to message the people at Petro. I think I blasted them on Twitter and Instagram and in the video. And then I called in. And then they got that charger fixed within three hours. So the charger that was down for over like a month was literally wow. left unlocked and open with a bunch of electrical stuff that I'm sure would zap you, was <laughs> fixed within like four hours or three hours of finally getting a hold of someone. So they can fix stuff. They just for some reason aren't fixing stuff. We got the excuse somebody said that they couldn't get the parts in in a small city between here and Calgary. That's uh, a good I excuse. I don't believe that. It's a good Not excuse. Not for a month. Though. Not for a month. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I can get a, a, a wrench on Amazon tomorrow. I mean, why can't they get, you know, a, a diode or a relay or a chunk of wire? I mean, come on. And they, they've got to have a base of spare parts for these things in a warehouse in Canada if you're running a charging network. It really makes me question the commitment that places like Petro Canada and other oil companies uh, that we have out here in Western Canada putting up chargers if they actually, if it's just not uh, greenwashing, if it's just not like show. I know they're not free, these things. They cost, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, but uh, they really need to do better. Nobody knows about it because it, this is going to, I really feel like this is going to be a hindrance to the EV adoption. If, you know, they say not enough chargers is a hindrance. Well, if none of them are working that you do have, that's a hindrance. That I'm not going to buy an EV um, that can't go on a road trip. So yeah. Well, it's, it's, the thing is, all the EVs are sold, selling out anyways, because there's a shortage of cars. So yeah, it, it like, it, it almost doesn't matter. Like they don't have to fix the chargers any sooner because P, all the EVs are still selling out. Like, right. I, I, I really don't know what's going on and why they're taking so long. I do think it's kind of like a PR stunt. Like they are greenwashing, like nobody actually cares except for Tesla. And that's why, you know, you go to a mall, it has one charger for the last or two chargers for the last uh, five years. Meanwhile, there's like 18 Tesla chargers there that have been there for a while too. <laughs> Tesla sees it as a business opportunity and for some reason no one else does. Yeah. Well, I think in, in, in my head, like Electrify Canada in America, that started because uh, Volkswagen got punished for Dieselgate, right? So it's yeah. like, do they really want it to all work? Like, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm not convinced. So uh, I, I wish it was better. And uh, hopefully, if I can't help get more chargers installed, at least I can maybe help get the chargers that are installed to be working at all times. Well, there's a lot of money going in from the federal government to new chargers. Um, I've got this crazy idea that says that uh, maybe Tesla should be the Kleenex of uh, uh, EV chargers. Maybe we should just let them run the network, you know, and open it up to third parties because it works. And because I don't trust anyone. I mean, I'm starting to not trust these companies like... Uh, I mean, literally, you can't, if you're planning a road trip and uh, you can't stop, you can't charge, and you have to buy a hotel room, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And I, th that can't continue. I don't know what to do. I think, uh, I guess a lot of us car reviewers probably need to do more road trips, more stuff revealing that, but it's hard. Like I said, like you get the car on a Monday or Tuesday yeah, and yeah. you have like a week to do the whole thing. And then can everyone afford to get put into a situation where they run out of juice in like Gananoque? Ah, I used to live, my family used to live in Gananoque. Thank you yeah. for the shout out. Yeah, it uh, seems like uh, my friend got stuck there in a Toyota Tercel once. He said it was the worst two days he's ever had. Yeah, understandable. <laughs> yeah, well, I recently did a road trip in my Tesla to Edmonton. That's a new charging network. And I was a little worried because if any one of them was not working, which does happen with the Tesla chargers, if any one of them was not working, I wouldn't have made it. I, I needed all the chargers. But, you know, they were all working, so um, it wasn't a problem. I've got a story here from uh, Drive Tesla Canada that came out yesterday. Uh, EV chargers on the Isle of Wight hacked to show porn. Okay. So uh, apparently there's these chargers in the Isle of Wight that have a screen on them, and somebody somehow hacked them to show porn. Porn. I so know they hacked them is, in Russia to show anti-Putin messages. And that that was another story as well, anti-Putin messages. So why would I you guess bother? Be, why would you bother hacking an EV charger? But the, the important question is, could they still charge? Because <laughs> <laughs> like at the end of the day, like, you know, whatever, as long as it's still charging. Yeah, exactly. I'm willing to watch porn as long as my damn car <laughs> charges. I'll, I'll sacrifice and watch some porn. Okay. <laughs> What do you, what do you, if you were king, what would you do for EV chargers? What would you, what's your solution? What's, is it government policy uh, the, or just people need to get their act together, the companies and themselves? All I know is that there's not enough chargers, there's not more chargers, and they're barely working. So they just need to like, okay, every en route, right? I spoke to the guys who are doing IV who have the contract for that. So they're putting in like maybe the four to six chargers for every en route, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to take like two years to do. But then are they going to expand it right after? They're not sure. So you're going to yeah. have like, have you ever come back from like the Quebec area after like a festival or something to Ontario? Well, I guess you haven't, but you come back and it's like, there's a million cars. It's hard to get gas at a rest stop. Right. Like it is going to be impossible yeah. for like electric cars to do anything. If there's, if there's four electric cars, they need to charge and there's yeah. one charger and they're all working like they're there for 45 minutes maybe and, and you got to think like 45 minutes that's like one car will take 45 minutes to charge and you don't know about the etiquette someone might try to charge at, yeah. and go in and then spend an extra half hour eating their burger king or something like mm -hmm. i think it's going to hit super hard one day where yeah. there's too many electric cars not enough chargers and it's going to be too late and we're just going to people are going to start buying gas cars again to like just be able to do road trips, I think, and do most of their I stuff. I know when the Model 3 came out in BC, there was a big push to get Model 3s. A lot of them were sold really quickly. And then they were starting to run out of superchargers on long weekends. And Tesla took about six months, but they put up more chargers. I, I don't see anyone else caring because, like Brian said, Tesla sees this as a business opportunity and not something else. What, what what do you think about like a, a an interact of EV charging networks like uh, one app for all, and uh... yeah, I think uh, my my buddy uh, William Clavy he writes over at Clavy's Corner. I think he says Quebec does that and it's the best. And every time we complain about charging in Ontario, he just says how much better it is in Quebec. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that would be a good solution too because like one app, cool, I get it. But like six apps that are holding your money and then there's like six places that could get hacked to have your credit card info or something. Yeah. It's just like, it just makes me feel uneasy. But I mean, if the chargers Quebec are getting hacked happened. and showing porn, maybe they can get your credit card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably how they buy it. And of course, Tesla is going to open up the chargers to third parties, but it'll be easier in Europe because everybody's on the CCS 
standard. So once they do it in North America, you will need an adapter, unfortunately, because the, the Tesla connector is uh, proprietary. So the, um, you know, you'll need a, like a CCS adapter for the Tesla charger as well as the app, but it, at least it's possible. Yeah, Jacob showed me some images in Europe of cars using the Tesla chargers. And since the uh, Tesla chargers are standardized to Tesla cars with the charging in the same position, now you've got non-Tesla EV cars screwing up the parking because they can't get in at the right angle. And yeah. so uh -huh. they're almost like icing Teslas as EVs kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, there's that too. Yeah, Tesla went, Tesla went with very short cables on their chargers, and I, I'm not sure why they did that. But, you know, it works if you have a Tesla. But if you don't have a Tesla, if the charging port is in a different spot. That's going to be a challenge. Um, this this could be a challenge. Yeah. I can see them doing They probably did that on purpose because they knew they were going to get forced into this, and they wanted to find, they, yeah. they wanted to have, a reason to not do it. And like, that's a smart business decision too, especially if like your customers are going to have to suffer now because the government's forcing you to let everyone charge on your system. That is like the selling feature of your system. Yeah, for sure. That might've been planned. Absolutely. Yuri, I thought maybe we could close out our time with you by talking about some of the more affordable EVs out there, um, which is what our, uh, a lot of our listeners are either just buying EVs or on are planning to. So and they're probably not going to buy the Porsche. I mean, I'd buy the Porsche. I think I'd buy the Porsche. Okay, uh, affordable EVs. I'm looking at my list of the stuff I really like. The old Ionic. I would love to buy one of those if I could find one with like used? decent range. Yeah, yeah, of course, used. Um, but it e has a very short range. That's not a killer for you? Yeah, I've got like five cars, so. Okay. <laughs> it's not a. Well, did not did a, you like it? Yeah, I what loved it. What did you like I, about it? It was still normal interior, hatchback. Normal. Uh and it was just normal. It was just normal car, but electric. And I think that was the coolest part. Um, let's see. The E Golf was pretty cool, but uh, I don't know if those have good batteries still. Uh, the i3 with the um, range extender was really cool because we ran out of electricity in that and just used the range extender, and that was fine. But I'm not sure how good those are as electric cars these days. You hated the ID4, I recall. Like everybody hates the ID4. It's the. It's the. Yeah. It's the. The SUV EV of our time that has fallen short, if I'm not mistaken. They did a lot wrong in that. And then they got the bad infotainment, which is also in the GTI and the Golf R. So that the ID4, I would uh, avoid. But there were nice things about it where you can like get in and go without a, you know having to turn on the car, which the new Volvo right. C40 also does. But that car is super expensive. But uh, one of my favorite EVs was the, um, the 2018 Smart for Two EQ Cabriolet. Is that um, right? I had a hoot in that car, top down, driving around. Like I was um, in like some traffic in Toronto and like just getting around car. Like it was the zippiest, most fun thing. Like, you know, it's a convertible. It was cool, a little turning radius. I had a great time. It had no range and it was super expensive. Right. So that was bad. But yeah. I really enjoyed that. It was like my own little Barbie car or something. You know, in three, three of the things you've mentioned are defunct now. The i3, um, the e-golf. The smart, yeah. At least in North America, and the smart car. Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, I like stuff that doesn't exist anymore. Maybe because those were the older cars that were normal but electric, and now everything right. is electric and, and electric weird. interior and kind of weird. Um, I know Jacob loves the Mustang Mach-E GT, but even there, like, nothing is really affordable, is it? Especially if you're not in a province or state with fixed the dealer pricing. You're going to get marked up, like, 10 to 20 on something new. So, like... Nothing is really affordable at all anymore for EVs, is it? But yeah, I mean, if Quebec has a great program, I bought my Leaf from Quebec because you know they'd had all the discounts, all the uh, the rebates, and the, the the used market was cheaper in Quebec, um, and it cost me a thousand dollars to ship it here. So I honestly have thought about flying to Montreal for a weekend and doing some car shopping. Um, because that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, the provinces where there's been incentives, there's more supply. But do they even need to give incentives anymore because all well, the cars are selling out anyway, so like the incentives are going to disappear <laughs> because of the chip shortage. And then like there's the weird cars like the MX-30 that only started selling in British Columbia and Quebec, not everywhere else at first. Yeah, too. yeah. that's a problem here as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly, there's no electric car that I think is like a good price right now that uh, you can get. Like the best thing to buy right now is probably an EV6 or an Ionic 5 or a Mach-E GT. 
other than that, you're just getting into like luxurious stuff that's that's kind of crazy and wild. But all the electric cars are fun to drive, and when the charging works, it's great. And I got to get another Tesla to drive and like try to road trip that because I do want to experience more of that. Well, most of Brian and I's uh, EV experience are charging overnight, and we never have to worry about that. Um, you know, except for the odd road trip. Uh, and in Brian's case, it's been pretty smooth sailing with the Tesla network. But um, generally speaking, that's kind of what's holding back cars is the range. Like, how can you do the one that, you know, it's like 2% of your driving is on the highway on average or something like that. And that's what's holding back EVs is the range and the difficulty of charging. Or if you live in an apartment or a condo that doesn't have, you know, charging at home, then you have to charge at the grocery store or something like that. Yeah, and uh, that, that would be fine too if you could like actually have chargers at grocery stores, but trying to find that is super rare too. So yeah, the Ionic 5 and the EV6, I do want to talk some more about those because I know you guys like those quite a bit, especially the Ionic 5. Um, I, you, in the video, you even mentioned you were close to thinking about buying one. Yeah, I, really? I, I wanted to buy that from Hyundai, like buy the PR unit, the demo unit when it's done, but I didn't like the seat comfort. The rear wiper thing, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a car for my wife to drive around my one-year-old in, and like, I'm, I'm not going to yeah, like... Yeah, no rear wiper. Yeah, I'm like, that's like, that's an oversight, and especially for it's like, for me, like, cool, I use my side mirrors, but like, for my wife driving, like, I don't want her to have to like, do workarounds for a brand new, like, $60,000 car, and um, <laughs> yeah, and then the infotainment still, it was like, kind of like, it's pretty all right, but... It just wasn't what I thought it would all be, but mostly the seat comfort. Like we just couldn't get comfortable in that, but the EV6 I was much more comfortable in, but then it had the weird capacitive touch buttons that I don't like and no wiper. Weird. I mean, it's the same platform, but uh, they use different seats. I'm surprised. Well, that's how they like customize, you know, you get, you get the, you know, different, you get to customize the body, a couple of infotainment things, different things on the inside to make the models different. So maybe that's where it comes in. But I, Jacob liked the seats. I just, for me, it wasn't a, uh, a good fit but then you got to think about like people pre-ordering them they'll never send them before they buy them and then by that point yeah. it's too late and uh <clears throat> they don't want to say they hate their seats they're just going to say yeah this feels great i'm not going to admit to anything because you're not going to admit to like <laughs> a seventy thousand dollar mistake right yeah you just make it work are you interested in any of the trucks that'll be coming out uh yes interested to drive them i mean we did drive that tesla cyber mini truck from hacksmith which was uh, yeah. a lot of oh, fun yeah. I mean, all those trucks look <laughs> really cool. It'll be interesting to see how they work for towing and stuff like that. Not that like we do any towing, but like uh, there's Truck King YouTube channel in Canada too. And I'm sure they'll do a lot of tests to really show you what it can and can't do. But yeah, I think those are going to be cool. Like the Rivian looks cool. The F-150 is probably going to just absolutely dominate the market. And Cybertruck, if it ever comes out, will be the coolest looking truck on the road. So I'm excited to see that. So Brian and I have been fascinated by EVs and waiting for EVs since we were kids in the 70s. Um, I take it that you're more of a, an average person on this, that you don't have a particular fascination with EVs. Uh, but what would you say to uh, regular people who are maybe skeptical about EVs and the coming transition that's sort of being forced on them one way or another uh, with, you know, 100% of car sales have to be EVs by different dates in different parts of the world, even in Canada. What would you say to um, petrol heads that would assure them that EVs are going to be okay? That What are the positive aspects of it? Oh, uh, well, they drive really nice, like a lot less, uh, you know, vibrations and stuff coming from the car. Um, they're fast. They're, like, pretty interesting looking. Like, they are, like, having that speed is really nice. Doing, like, being able to drive one pedal driving is interesting, too. You almost have more fun trying to be more economical in your driving than instead of like driving fast and like shifting gears and stuff like in an old school kind of car. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a petrol head, petrol head, uh, and you wanted to like still drive like a manual gas car, like if you think about it today, you can still buy a Model T and drive it on public roads. Sure. Like you can go on any highway with it. <laughs> so if someone's yeah. like, they're not going to make cool gas cars anymore, like all the cool gas cars already exist. Like, you'll always be able to probably drive them. Like, let everyone else go EV. You can still have your gas car and you can have your EV car for, you know, e gas car for the weekends. Like, it's fine. For the petrol heads, everything is fine. Don't worry about it. You can still drive your cool gas cars. Yeah. They'll, they'll always be around. Yeah, there's no way they could, like, ban them, especially not in America. Like, America's going to let 
uh, the government ban them from driving any car they've ever yeah. bought in the past? Like, no chance. No, I, I sus- if I lived long enough, I think there might come a day where I might actually get into a petrol car and say, wow, this reminds me of my childhood. You know, it would be a, a overwhelming nostalgia feeling if I was in a lot of EVs or, um, you know, robo taxis or something like that. Like digging out the vinyl in the turntable. Yeah, yeah well, sure. well, my my kid's one right now, so I'm wondering if she's going to take her uh, driver's license test in an EV. Yeah, my kid took his or, driver's or license gas test in an EV. Mine was the first one in Saskatchewan to take a get his license in an EV. Oh, nice! And uh, it worked to his advantage because the instructor hadn't seen an EV before, so he was sort of distracted. <laughs> yeah, the the cool car rule always <laughs> works really well. Like I took my driver's license in a in a Camaro, and he was like, uh, "Nice." Oh. 83? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, let's roll. And I screwed up a bit, still passed, but um, I'm let's hoping- Let's see what this thing could do. Maybe when my daughter goes for her driver's license, I'll uh, have her go in my Plymouth Prowler. That'll be a fascinating thing. Yeah. There was a news story a few months ago about somebody who was using autopilot during a driver's test on, in a Tesla. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think they failed. Uh, that's because I know um, if you take the test now, they'll have a piece of paper that they put over your reverse camera because you're supposed to really? uh, reverse and parallel park with like just your eyes. But I guess everything's going to change oh, in I the didn't future. Know that. Yeah, they they got oh, a little wow. thing to cover it right away. Um, I took my driver's test with my son during COVID, so the in, the tester had to drive behind us in a car because everything was COVID safe. So I had to sit in the passenger seat. So there was somebody there, but I was forbidden from talking. Like I couldn't do anything or say anything or make any hand <laughs> gestures or anything. Don't so hit that pylon. I just had to sit there and, and uh, hope that my son didn't crash into something. <laughs> oh, that's been fun. Yuri, it's been a blast. And we're, we're so glad that you took the time out. Uh, I, I guess, you know, you must be a busy person. You've got a one-year-old. You've got a YouTube channel that needs feeding constantly. We're thrilled that you chose us to take time, and I'm sure your fans are going to have uh, be really in, enjoy uh, seeing a conversation with you. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for talking so much about environmental stuff because I do want to be environmental as much as I like my gas cars. Like I, you know, I like the climate. I want everything to be going in a better direction. But man, those chargers, like we just need to get them working. I think. Absolutely. All right. Well, is is there anything uh, you want to plug, Yuri? Where can people find you uh, on the internet? Uh, Straight Pipes on YouTube for new car reviews twice a week. But more importantly, make sure you subscribe to this channel on YouTube because the algorithm. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. The Clean Energy Show wants to hear from you. Contact us on Twitter, Clean Energy Pod, by email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, by voicemail, speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll be back next week with a normal show. See you then.